excited this morning. We're, we're starting a, uh, a series on the book of Daniel, and uh, it's entitled, In the Heat of the Moment. That's ironic, isn't it? <laughs> we're going to be starting at Daniel 1 this morning, but I kind of wish we were on chapter 3. That's the chapter with the fiery furnace. <laughs> Before we do that, um, I would like to uh, just give us a moment to pray quietly before God, to God, and, um, and then I'll pray. So let's, uh, let's quiet ourselves before the Lord. Let me start with a question. Are you pessimistic or optimistic? Now, if you've ever done a search online for pessimism jokes, it can be quite funny. I have to share a few. I'm such a pessimist that my glass is three quarters empty. I'm so pessimistic that I don't even own a glass. And Mark Twain is, is reported to have said this, there is no sadder sight than a young pessimist, except an old optimist. <laughs> Let me ask another question. Are we pessimistic when it comes to living out our faith. And here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. Should we always expect a negative response? Should we always respect, expect a negative response? And I can, I can sympathize with Ken. He mentioned being picked on in high school. It doesn't sound like my, my, my plight was quite as severe as yours, Ken, but on the uh, Halifax West soccer team, my nickname was Flanders. If you don't know what that means, you can ask me later. Should we always expect a negative response? I would argue that if we're looking at the book of Daniel, and even if we look at Jesus himself, the answer to that question is no, not always. Yes, and we'll look at this next time in weeks to come. Sometimes there is a hostile response to our faith. Sometimes it isn't fun. It's not always raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. But sometimes God's wisdom does make sense, and we shouldn't be overly pessimistic. We should be hopeful. We should be expectant about what God can do. But let's set the scene here. Let's look at the big picture historically. The, these, these, these court tales from Daniel 1 to 6 are set in the 6th century BC. What's going on there? Well, in Israel's history, there was a civil war. The country was divided in two. The northern part of the country, the much bigger section geographically, was referred to as simply Israel. The lower, smaller section of the country was known as Judah, named after one of the tribes. And the capital of Judah was Jerusalem, and the descendants of King David ruled the southern kingdom, Judah. Pretty simple. So in 7, like the 721 B.C., the northern kingdom succumbed to the Assyrian Empire. In 586 BC, the southern kingdom succumbed to the Babylonians. And, but a little bit before that, so at the very beginning of the 6th century BC, this dude named Nebuchadnezzar, or immortalized in Veggie Tales as Nebuchadnezzar, 
big pickle. How many of you have seen Veggie Tales? You know what I'm talking about. I cannot read that name without thinking of a giant pickle now. So, beginning of the 6th century, Nebuchadnezzar starts his assault on Judah, on Jerusalem. And this is where the story of Daniel comes in. And in keeping with kind of ancient war customs, the best and the brightest of the, the, the country that's being conquered, they're carted off to exile. And they, 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 these people are trained. They're, they're slaves, but they're, they, they want to infiltrate the, 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 the elite of the, the conquered society in order to, to really drive home the fact that, that you're not in charge anymore. We're in charge. And we want to, we want to take the, the best and the brightest and make them our own. And that's what the Babylonians are doing to Daniel and his friends. And they're chosen to be part of the, the king's court program. That would look really good on your resume. And it's possible, possible that Daniel and his friends were, were from a royal or priestly lineage. And it's, it's even possible that they were eunuchs. They were castrated so as to be able to give their full attention to the matters of the king. But what is certain is what we find in verse 4. It says this, that these, these four young men, and probably others, were trained in the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Now, who are the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans are the, the ancient people group that took over Babylon some years before, and, but it became, a term, it became a term for a special group of wise men. So these were the educated. And, and think, of, think of the foundation year at King's on steroids. That's what these guys were enrolled in. They learned the language. They learned Akkadian. That's not A-C-A-D-I-A-N. It's A-K-K. -K. You might remember a really bad movie from about 10 years ago with The Rock, Scorpion King. He was an Akkadian, A-K-K, -K. anyway. Um, so they learned this language. It's an ancient Semitic language. And they learned all about Babylonian customs and, and magic and wisdom. They were trained to be sages in the court of the king. And so this scene is set for a showdown. The wisdom, on the one hand, the wisdom and ways of Babylon and its gods versus the wisdom and ways of the God of Israel. The God of Israel. And to really drive this home, to really kind of add insult to injury, Daniel and his friends, their Hebrew names are changed to Babylonian names. So, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious or the Lord is gracious. Mishael means who is like God. And Azariah means Yahweh is my helper or Yahweh has helped me. They're given these Babylonian names, names that refer to the Babylonians, Babylonian gods, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach. And Abednego. Strangely, we're more familiar with the Babylonian names. But that's neither here nor there. And the question of the hour is this. Is this name change symbolic of what's going to happen to the hearts and minds of these young men? Is it foreshadowing what's going to happen to them on the inside? Are the seductive and immoral ways of the foreign court going to have their way with these young guys. And of course, we don't have to read very far to know that the, the, the short answer is a resounding no. Verse eight is very, very important in our passage. You can look at it. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. The reference, of course, is to being ritual, ritually pure. The law of Moses dictated that you can't eat certain things. That would be unclean. You were supposed to separate yourself to show that you'd been chosen by God, that the Israelites had been chosen by God. And Daniel and the boys... They came to the conclusion that the food from the king's table was or maybe 
perhaps was ritually impure or unclean. And Daniel, he starts to scratch his head and he says, you know, let's have a little contest. Let's see what, let's see what we can do about this. Let's see who has the better complexion after eating the respective diets. It's pretty sly. And we know what happens. Verse 15. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So, Noxema guys get noticed. And more than that, though, the wisdom, and this is, this is really, if we want to put the passage in a nutshell, the wisdom of Daniel and, the, and, and his friends far exceeded that of their Babylonian peers. So, no, Babylon did not corrupt these young guys. And yes, God's wisdom outshines that of the Babylonians. If we just wanted to put it in a nice package, there it is. But this passage has so much more, and it should prompt us to ask so much more. Here's what I mean. It's so, so easy, and maybe you have kind of come to this conclusion on your own. Maybe you've, maybe you've wrestled with this, but it's so, so easy to set up a cultural war when it comes to our faith and leave it at that. Everything is black and white. Everything is right and wrong. There's a Christian way to do it, and there's a non-Christian way to do it. Folks, I agree that, yes, sometimes there's definite right and wrong, and sometimes it just stares us in the face, and unless we are completely blind and ignorant, well, it's just there. But other times, and quite often, in fact, it's a lot more complicated. It's not that easy. One commentator puts it this way. The abstinence that Daniel and his friends partake in does not reflect general opposition to gen Gentile culture. Gentiles are the people who aren't Israelite, but insists on limits to assimilation. It's just a fancy way of saying they're not hostile to anything and everything just because it's not from Israel. But there are times, there are places where a line has to be drawn or maybe should be drawn. And that is the kicker, if I can put it that way. That's the challenge. Trying to figure out in our culture where to draw the line and how to draw the line. And the good thing is, if we believe that God's wisdom far exceeds that of the world because he's the one who made the world and keeps it going, then we need God's wisdom to know how to live as people of faith in the world. It's, pretty, it's a pretty simple conclusion. But where and how? Wrestling with God to figure these things out. Talking to people to figure things out. That's the challenge. And more specifically, I think there are three kind of points we can hang our hat on when it comes to articulating this challenge. And the first, the first is this. I've alluded to it already. It's so very easy to be hostile to or to hate the culture around us as Christians. It can so easy devolve, because it can so easily devolve into hating people or coming across that way. Maybe you can think of a, a time in your life when you've, you've really set out to do the right thing, but it's come across the wrong way. It's come across as, well, I don't like you. Or I'm just, you know, angry. My faith makes me angry, and I don't want to have anything to do with the world. We have to avoid this. And just look at Daniel's example. It isn't one of hostility or being angry or violent confrontation. No, it's not. And, and sometimes the, the old axiom, love the sinner, hate the sin, 
Sometimes the line is, is, is blurry. I don't like that expression because the line becomes blurred. And often we start, of course we hate sin, but it's far too easy when we're thinking like that to start to hate the sinner. That's something we must avoid at all costs. So just setting up kind of a blanket line in the sand when it comes to the culture war, that's not the way to go. And sometimes when we do that, or, or when we're trying to, to work these things out, the danger is gravitating towards one extreme or the other, permissiveness on one side, or legalism on the other. Well, we don't want to hate culture, and we want to accept people, and we want to, to love people, so we're just, you know, anything goes. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but that's dangerous. Legalism, on the other hand, is, is, is making up rules and keeping rules that God hasn't even asked us to keep in the first place. We talked about this in Bible study last week and how there might be a rule here, something God asks us not to do, and in order to keep that rule, we put other rules around it. And then we don't want to break that rule, so we'll keep this rule out here that God hasn't even asked us to keep in the first place. And then it becomes something like, well, if you don't do that too, if you don't keep the rules, or at least keep the, 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 the hedge around the rule like I do, well, you're less spiritual than I am. That's very, very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. And we can, we can just say no to everything. No movies, no cards, no dancing. Those are kind of some old school examples. You know what I'm talking about. And we can start to come up with Christian everything. We were, um, we were in our, uh, our home group last week and we were watching a video and uh, the, the, uh, the, the teacher in the video jokingly suggested that um, Christians even make up their own bad words, like fooey daddy or something like that. And we, we, we get to the point where if, if something isn't explicitly Christian, it's bad. I'm not suggesting we go around with potty mouths. Absolutely not. But we just need to be so careful that we don't come across as legalistic because that... that that corrupts our souls as well. One thing, as I was thinking about this, it's so easy just to talk about avoiding the extremes. But as I was thinking about this this week, if somebody asked us as Christians why we do something or why we don't do something, how often have we said, well, it's just, you know, God doesn't want us to do that. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody where you explain why maybe it's not a good idea to do something or maybe why something is a good idea? Trying to un it's a roundabout way of trying to get at the heart of the matter. Trying to get at why God gave us these guidelines in the first place. And helping to explain that, I think, would go a long way from avoiding the extreme. Think about, let, let's take two examples. First is caring for the poor. Why do we care for the poor? So we get a, a gold star on our theological chart? So we can earn our way into God's good books? We know those aren't the right answers. So why do we care for the poor? Oh, you're just trying to look good. How about we explain to people why we take care of the poor for this reason? Because as a Christian, I believe that every single person, every single person, rich, poor, black, white, whatever, is created in the image of God himself. And therefore, that person 
has intrinsic value and worth to God and to this world. Explaining why, going deeper, or maybe a, a, a slightly more negative example, talking about sex. Why are Christians so strict and stingy when it comes to sex? Christians have a funny way of dealing with and, and talking about sex. Here, here's how Ben Witherington, a New Testament scholar, put it. He said, Christians love to say that sex is awful and it's dirty and, it, and it's wicked, but you want to save it for the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. I'm sorry if I'm making you uncomfortable with this conversation. Not really. But here's the thing. It goes back to the same rationale. If every single person is created in the image of God and are, are worth something incredible to God, then treating people as objects, treating people as things, or even talking about people in ways that reduce them to things or objects or just outlets for the expression of desire, that goes against everything. It goes against the fabric of, of God's creation. So explaining why and understanding why is at least part of, of the puzzle, part of, of digging deeper for God's wisdom to avoid the extremes of legalism and permissiveness. But the third challenge is this. And again, it's something I alluded to at the beginning. It's expecting positive results. You know, so often we live in fear. We're afraid that people will make fun of us for our faith, or we're afraid people won't understand our faith. Or, you know, those, sometimes that's, that's, that's realistic, that expectation, but that doesn't mean that we should live in fear. First of all, God will help us deal with, I'm jumping a gun, but God will help us deal with whatever comes our way when it comes to living out our faith. But how about this? How about being the best and expecting the best? The Apostle Paul talks about cultivating the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And what if, as followers of Jesus, what if cultivating that fruit meant working really hard at developing those characteristics in our lives? And in fact, I wouldn't, that's to water it down. What if, as Christians, we were to be the best examples we can think of, of being loving, of being joyful and peaceful, and patient, and kind, and good, and faithful, and self-controlled? What if, as Christians, it was our goal, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be the best examples in our world of those things? What if we just took one of those things and dedicated our attention to it? Because, one, we know the world needs it, and two, if we truly believe that God created the world, then he will give us what we need to live out and be those prime examples of what it means to be truly human. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, it's on the front of your bulletin, he said, let your light shine before men so they will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, just a few lines before, Jesus said, blessed are you when, when people persecute you and say all kinds of wicked things about you because of me. Rejoice, he says, 
But that's not the whole story. Yes, we'll talk about that part of it in coming weeks. But we need to, we need to have the full meal deal here. Do we really believe that as followers of Jesus Christ, our life, the life he calls us to, will make a difference in the world. If we don't answer yes to that question, then we have a big problem. So working hard and being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that work, to, to produce this fruit, that's part of what being a Christian is all about. And I, I want to close with some thoughts from what are some very famous passages when it comes to our salvation in the New Testament. Romans 5 and Romans 8. Paul is writing his magnum opus when it comes to understanding what it means to be forgiven by God and to understand how it works, how God has justified us in taking care of our problem of sin. It's, it's a wonderful read, Romans, well, the whole book of Romans, but 5 through 8 in particular. And he sets out in chapter 5 by talking about in and through Jesus' death, God has condemned sin. The judgment for sin fell on Jesus, and thereby that judgment has been taken from us when we accept Jesus' death on our behalf. That's in chapter 5. And a little bit later, chapter 8, somebody should really write a hymn to these words. It says, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. And what does Paul do? He connects that fact with life in the Spirit. And life in the Spirit is real life true life, life the way that it was meant to be experienced. And part of that life, in light of what we read this morning and talked about this morning, is this, seeing the goodness of God and following God and his wisdom when it comes to how, how to live, seeking God's wisdom. God promises to help us. What does he say? <coughs> In the very, very same passage in Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God. He connects this to walking in the Spirit. Seek Him. Striving to be the best. Live out the fruit of the Spirit. If this life, if this, this, the fact that we are no longer under sin's condemnation, then, then walk in the Spirit and strive to be the best the best examples of what it means to be human. And be hopeful. Because if all of that is true, and we believe that it is, what other response do we have than to be hopeful? And that at least sometimes, people will see a difference, and people will look at our lives and praise our Father who is. May we think about these things as we live out our faith in the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story of Daniel and his companions in the court of the Babylonians and how Daniel chose to do what he felt and knew was the right thing to do. And you rewarded him for that. May we do the same thing, and may, like Daniel, and as Jesus suggested, may we see that people see you working in us. May we not be afraid, and may our lives prompt others to give praise to you, our Father in heaven. Amen.